if this is the style that you want to play, then playing melodies is not the thing that you want to do, actually. Unless it's maybe some kind of funky synthesizer hook or whatever. I don't, I don't know if you know uh, Avicii songs or, you know. Oh, yeah. These, yeah. These, yeah these, these are built on melodic hooks. Well, okay. Most of the time, these can be pretty cool to play then. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Welcome to episode 86 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast and a special welcome to Inner Circle members around the world. Thanks for tuning in today and I know you're going to get a lot out of the episode. My name is Tim Topham and I'm the teacher behind the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas and actionable teaching strategies to help you provide the richest and most exciting and fun learning experiences for your piano students. Today's show notes Today's awesome freebie download, which I'll talk about in a second, and a full transcript are available as usual from timtopham.com slash episode 86. In today's first podcast episode of Pop Teaching Month, we're chatting with a very cool dude from the Netherlands who's giving away his top five piano teaching hacks. This guy actually studied pop piano at conservatory level and now teaches pop to students all over the world. So he's definitely got a few tips up his sleeve. He's also giving away a fantastic download today. It's his Bare Essential Keys to Harmony, which is a full color 44 page ebook dedicated to helping students and teachers understand the theory, harmony, and melodic information that they need to understand and be able to play pop. This is going to be a fantastic resource for any classically trained teachers and something that you could share with adult and teenage students if they're showing an interest in pop and want to do some more research. It includes exercises and some great stories and generally so much information. I can't believe he's giving it away for all of my listeners. You can find out more and grab that full color ebook at timtopham.com slash episode 86. Today's guest hails all the way from the Netherlands. After graduating from the Amsterdam Conservatory and getting experience as a professional musician in the industry, he started devoting time to deconstructing the musical language to simplify learning and teaching. He's the author of the five-star rated method, Hack the Piano, and is currently teaching over 90,000 happy students worldwide through his YouTube channel. He's a funny guy because he takes a cold shower every morning, and I don't know how anyone does that, and says he can figure out and play a song by ear in under five minutes, and often instantly. But give him a traditional score, and it's likely to take him the whole day. My de- guest today is Kun Moda, and I hope you enjoy the interview. Kun, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much, Tim. It I'm is, happy to be here. It's awesome to speak with you finally. We have been talking for, I don't know, it's probably two years or thereabouts online. I think we hooked up when I brought out my pop piano teaching course or thereabouts, and somehow we got together online. We've been chatting regularly ever since, and uh, we finally got you onto the podcast today to talk all about your experience with pop music. So again, thank you for being with us. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. All right. So can you just tell us just a little bit about your pop piano journey? Um, How did you get into focusing on pop music instead of being a traditional classical musician? Yeah, well, actually, long story and a short version. I'll, I'll try to keep it concise, but it basically it's just pop was what I liked at the moment that I was getting into music. Because when I was a small child, my mom said, okay, you can pick an instrument, okay, and I got to choose the piano. Uh, I think I was about four or five years old and went to the traditional classical training. But after about, let's say, I think six months, maybe a year, it was just pretty obvious that this wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. So I quit, actually the piano journey over there and then fast forward to when I was about 17 and I just switched high schools because uh, I got stuck in the third uh, third grade and had to switch to another school right 
got to got to that school and uh, some friends of mine told me about this musical night that was organized over there where I went to and saw my fellow students, new friends that I made over there, perform on stage like uh, true rock stars, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. And I just, you know, that was sort of the trigger for me to say, uh, wow, this is so cool. I have, to, I have to be able to do something like that myself as well. Went back to the piano that we still had at our home and... Uh, I don't know. I just uh, I just sat behind it and uh, started figuring out some songs by ear and never went back to a lesson so right go. up until I went to the conservatory. Actually, that was my my first actual new piano lesson. And uh, that, I don't know. That's uh, that's how it goes uh, or that's how it went. And, uh, you know, it was just what we were what we were listening to at home as well. My mom was a big fan of uh, Stevie Wonder and the Beatles and all that kind of stuff. So, mm. And there's lots uh, of kids out there who would be picking out melodies by ear, you know, just mucking around on the piano. Uh, and yeah. uh, the unfortunate thing, of course, is that oftentimes there's nowhere for them to go because there aren't teachers who uh, know what to do with a student like that. So was I, it, was, yeah. I, I, so I was going to say, I hope today we're able to give some teachers some of the ideas of what they could do if they got a young kun in their um, mm -hmm. in their studio <laughs> that's exactly the thing that i'm trying to do as well yeah <laughs> actually so yeah, tell me with what, that in mind. what kind of students do you teach now do you teach in a home studio or at a school or online what do you do at the at the moment i've actually uh taken a break from the actual physical one-on-one -on -one students uh so n nothing in home what i did up until like six months ago maybe a year even now was uh, I, I went to a um, music school, had a room over there where I could teach uh, private piano lessons. Students range from, uh, I don't know, I want to say, uh, I think about nine years old, my youngest, up until maybe 50 for the older. So it's just kind of like uh, all age groups. Mm -hmm. but, but actually, for, for the moment, I'm uh, focusing on uh, the online stuff. And and that's that's really just anything you can imagine because I I now have uh, almost one hundred thousand YouTube followers so I nice job. treat I treat them as individual students at least I try to so uh, and the uh, the the website is going pretty okay as well so I I have a lot of contact with with. Uh, plethora of different <laughs> kinds of uh, students <laughs> good uh good use of that word you better tell everyone yeah. uh where you're from in the world too because english is, isn't your first language is it no 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 right. it's not um i'm from holland from amsterdam fantastic and no. uh i'm interested we'll talk about your online work uh shortly it's actually mm -hmm. your website is called piano couture c-o-u-t-u-r-e right now i've always sure. associated the word couture over here in English speaking language with uh, with fashion high end fashion yeah. boutiques right yes, so yes, yes. why <laughs> did you decide to use this word for your website it's quite unusual yeah um because i wanted to make clothes what <laughs> first hand. no no yeah, well it's it's kind of a, a joke kind kind of not on the other hand uh, when I when I was was done with the uh, conservatory study, I was teaching a lot back then, and actually I, I kind of thought about maybe taking a break from the whole musical journey. You know, my last year at the conservatory was really intense with a lot of practice. Well, you you, you know you know mm -hmm. the story about that. You know, so. Yeah. So I, I kind of wanted to, to to see where I could take this. Maybe you know start a business or do, does it have to do something with music? Yes, no, yes, no. Well, long story short, I wanted really wanted to make t-shirts actually, piano inspired t-shirts. Ah, that makes sense. And now. then yeah, and then I wanted to make sort of. I was pondering about a combination with actual piano playing and an actual, you know, somewhat like a culture. And I figured couture, well, it sounds sort of similar. And I wanted to make it also, how do I say this nicely? 
<laughs> contemporary contemporary that was my thing you know yeah. i was also my my conservatory study i studied pop music so no classical training for me over there actually we'll, go, um, we'll talk about I, that in a sec too because that's pretty cool yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 it was but in that sense i wanted to you know put forward this whole piano playing and piano study training thing as something that is kind of cool and contemporary and I don't know. I just, and and that, like that's, a that's culture to... and... Uh, exactly. Yeah. It's and that's how this worked. And, yeah. yeah. It just popped in my mind. I think I read it somewhere at a clothing brand and, and just figured, oh, my, it's, it just sounded cool. I don't know. I like Actually, it. my well, first different. my first name was Amsterdam or Amsterdam Piano Couture. I think something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I figured, no, I'll just drop the Amsterdam and Piano Couture. Oh, it makes fine. sense. So yeah. uh, just before we get on to, we're going to talk about your top five piano hacks really, really soon. Uh, yeah. And maybe I think you might even have one bonus one, but uh, we'll stick to the five at the moment. Before we do that, you've mentioned the conservatory a couple of times. And I know all the yeah. teachers listening will be picturing a uh, old school institution, violins, classical music, pipe organs, no. all that kind of stuff. No. Tell me if it had... We your conservatory experience really quickly <laughs> okay well um i was kind of like a basement with a lot of smoke and uh <laughs> 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 no, that's where we started actually it was more you know uh that that rock rock school movie well that's kind mm. of the kindergarten version of what my school actually was it was uh a mixture between heavy metal rock dude singer songwriters soulful mm, singers and i don't know just a mix of all different kinds of persons and uh yeah it was focusing on uh playing in a band writing music uh playing keyboards not just piano we had to learn uh electric piano synthesizers as well and uh Played together a lot with guitarists. We also had to learn guitar, had to play drums and all. But I think that's really good for someone's musical development. You know, if you're absolutely able to to translate stuff to other instruments and yep, yep. I learned. Uh, well, I didn't. I didn't study it, but I, I have played guitar. I've played drums, and I think uh -huh. cool. uh, a lot of that does inspire the way I approach rhythm teaching and uh, and and the chordal aspect of music. And I know that you've probably got some similar views on that. Uh, uh, what absolutely. was the name of your conservatory? Uh, the Amsterdam Conservatory. It's just the uh, the pop music department that I there did there. I haven't heard of anything like it before, Kuhn, so I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to put a link to it on yep. our show notes today so that other people can check it out. I think that might be interesting. Yeah, cool. All right, well, let, let's get into your five pop piano hacks. Now, just in case yep. uh, people don't understand this word hack and how we're using it, um, you better mm -hmm. just describe what, what what are we actually talking about with a, with a hack? <laughs> I know it's a pretty cool word that's used a bit these days. Yeah, too fashionable maybe. But, you know, the, this was like five years ago when I was still young and thought that was cool. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> oh, and you're so no, old no, no. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no. But the thing is, this is, um, I'm, I'm trying to state that it's different from the classical approach somehow. I don't know. I think so many people think that you need to learn piano by first learning how to read sheet music. And actually, I think that that's not necessary at all. I'm not against sheet music or whatever. I think it can come in handy, obviously it can come in handy at various different, different occasions, especially for classical music. But uh, I think that when you approach music through a harmony chord pattern approach i don't know we'll, maybe we'll talk about that more later i guess it's sort of an unconventional approach i think and that's why i call it hack because you know people think they have to do this and i try to prove that it can also be done with the opposite so to speak so that's why i call it a hack Nice. I like I like the idea. And mm. um, as anyone who's listened to my podcast uh, in the last couple of years would know that I obviously share a lot of the same views on a harmonic approach to, to teaching music as you do. Uh, and I, I like to um, to see it as something that can align 
at the same time, I guess, as reading, uh, because I know for, for many teachers to take the reading away from music lessons uh, mm. leaves a massive hole there. And it's like, what, what do we fill it with? So I think we'll talk about yeah. some of those kinds of things today. But uh, this, yeah. is, this is great. Let's, let's get started with the top five pop piano hacks. So these are, I guess, approaches, ideas around teaching and the top five things that you think teachers should know about teaching pop. So let's start with number one. What's, yep. what's number one? My first hack that I <laughs> that I wrote down was uh, to approach and teach music like a language. And uh, as a subheading, I wrote down the uh, the words and phrases approach. Why? Uh, well, okay. Let me try and explain this. The thing is, I think that, or I try to compare reading sheet music and starting with reading sheet music, kind of like. Uh, spelling in a language and what I, I try to compare the words when you try to learn a new language with chords in a sense I think it makes sense immediately because you know a chord has multiple notes as has a word multiple letters mm -hmm. but also and this is why I think maybe it's a hack or at least sort of a shortcut in a sense when you try to learn a new language and you get a couple of words presented, then this makes way more sense and you'll remember those words, maybe even a short sentence or something is, is something that you'd start with when you learn a new language. You know, that's, that makes more sense than starting with the grammar rules, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Also, if you have a couple of those words uh, in your vocabulary and you can mix them around, just like when you know a couple of chords, then you can build different sentences and you can already sound better than maybe the understanding of the actual grammar rules that you have at that moment. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're, you're suggesting that one of the approaches that we can use is to mm -hmm. help students understand that in order to read the language of music, they should mm -hmm. be thinking about blocks of words, which you're exactly. ex explaining as being chords, and so yeah. the, the, the vertical approach to music. We should be looking yeah. at that rather than note to note to note to note, which is like you know spelling out a word, C-A-L-A-N-D, whatever ex it is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, because in the end, all note for note for note, a note sequence, it, it can all be led back to the harmony that it comes from, right? Yeah, 100%. If I, if I play a, a C, E, G in a concession, then you could also say that's just a broken up C triad, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, that's a valuable thing. And that's why I like to start with this approach, because I think that way is just way easier for people to for uh yeah for new students or any any type of musician actually to remember a uh, a larger amount of uh, of notes because they see it as a block yeah and I've, make, I've, make I've compared it to uh guitarists and i think you've done this in some of your exactly. writing uh, your guitarists yeah. will learn probably at their first lesson they'll learn a couple of chord shapes and exactly. add a little bit of rhythm and suddenly they sound like a rock star <laughs> Whereas, yeah, yeah, whereas yeah. poor old pianists come to their first lesson often and mm -hmm. they might learn to read middle C and a D if they're lucky. Uh, and, you know, that's their their lesson for the week. And, and I, I can totally see why so many kids quit because that just is so uninspiring for so many. Exactly. And sure, we both agree that, you know, reading is a valuable skill and we should be teaching that. But hey, let's give them some of the sure. skills to uh, to be able to play some cool stuff um, yeah. that's based on some chords and harmony uh, so, yeah. that, so that they can go uh, go home and explore music uh, in, a, in, a, in a greater sense than just single notes. I'm with you there. Yeah, yeah, and that's just when you're stuck, when you're talking about the start because you know it's way more engaging than, as you say, uh, difficult. Maybe playing one, two, three notes to play full chords, maybe two or three in a row, which is actually just two grips. You know, you're just learning two things. So whether that's two different notes or two different grips, let's say a C and a G chord, and you can already play. You know, yep. so one and a four and a one and four or one and a five, depending on how you see it. That's for the start, but also in, in later uh, stadium, I think that when you have this court knowledge, you also see more 
correlations and in the reading itself. Yeah, kids understand the, what they're seeing in front of them because they, they exactly. know a little bit about the harmonic structure of music. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's way more easy to rem remember it that way as well. You used the word grip <clears throat> before. Is that yeah? Uh, you, you mean like a chord shape? Is that what that means? Yeah, that that's that's what I mean. Yeah, but it I, I because just like a guitarist, you know, would have a grip on his the neck of his guitar. Yep. We can also just put our hand in a specific form, and I know this might for you classically trained musicians. This this probably is a horror show <laughs> remark, but. <laughs> If you just keep your hand like that, for somebody that's just starting out, this is a really easy way to just grab the chord and then whoosh, move your hand over to the next note. And the same grip over there mm -hmm. works to form another, you know, major or minor triad, whatever you're playing. Yeah, it's like bar chords on a guitar, right? Exactly, but, yeah. And you can go, dum, bum, 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 bum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, really you got easily. it. <laughs> so using this, um, this approach, the, the words and phrases of music rather than note-to-note -note music teaching. Have you got mm -hmm. just, just one or two ideas of how that could look in the first, I don't know, six weeks of a piano lesson with a student? What, what would you recommend teachers do? Let's, let's make it really practical. What could you encourage them to do or try? Uh, well, I'd say teach them, uh, you know, when you, when you keep, when you stay in, in the key of C, then you only have the white notes. So... I'd say teach them a chord progression one four five C F G, mm -hmm. or maybe throw in A minor as well. You have a six, and as you probably know, as many of your listeners probably know, you can build literally a million songs already from that. That's kind mm -hmm. of the 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 <laughs> chord progression of pop music. So. You'll probably find dozens of songs that your student likes. If I, I'm assuming that it's now a, a kid or whatever that wants to play this contemporary pop styles or whatever. Mm -hmm. But even if it's somebody that wants to get into classical later, you know, Bach also uses a lot of these modes. Uh, how mm -hmm. do you say that? Sequences. So this way they get a sense of the sound color that these different modes have and also they get you know they they can actually start playing with these things i'd say pick the song that they want to play and make them play along to it if it's a song so make sure it's in c or you know and the, so that they get a sense of when these chord changes occur and how it sounds when they're not playing the exact melody or the exact harmonic parts that are underneath it but just laying down that chord over there, which which kind of fits anyway, although it's not the actual part that an instrument is playing, maybe. After that, I'd say get them to clap along to the song so that they get a sense of the rhythm. Mm -hmm. Let's clap in quarters or something. And then... You mean um, keeping a beat? Yeah, keeping a yeah. beat, but just really clapping. So just, you know... The, the quarter beats or whatever yeah. so that they can follow along with the song they get a sense of the rhythm and then you let them play that with their right hand while they just follow the root notes with the left hand so you get you know a, a, a flowing piano part actually already that's that's kind of the basis of how many singer songwriters or whatever would would accompany themselves or any other singer yeah, exactly. So yeah. It, I think that's a pretty engaging way to play a song, but also they get a good sense of rhythm. They get a good sense of how the notes feel underneath their fingers. We're starting about, we're talking about total beginners now, right? That was your question. Uh, yeah. Yep. Correct. Yeah. So and they get a sense of the modes. They have a major and a minor chord, so that's kind of important as well. Yeah, I think that that would be something. That it's, you could do for, and 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 this this could only take two or three weeks maybe, but then in week four just change up the song, change up the chord order, and make them see that these words underpin more than just the single song that they picked out first. Mm. And I think this approach is almost essential for a teenager, a teenage beginner, uh, and yeah. and for adults too, particularly adults who would like to play music that they know. 
uh, you know, that they listen to. So uh, whereas a six or seven-year-old child might not know what pop music they like or want to play, uh, they might find a chord shape actually quite difficult to play. So they might only be able to use a couple of notes at a time, like a, a C and an E instead of a C, E, G for a C chord. Sure, um, straight the five away. and then, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I think this this approach definitely, if, if anyone listening is having trouble connecting with, engaging with teenagers, particularly when they're beginners, then this mm-hmm. is the approach. This is the approach to use because the student is learning a whole lot at the same yeah. time as they're playing music that is a hundred percent relevant to them. So they'll get it, and that's the important part, in my opinion. Exactly. Yeah, it's engaging. That's super important. Yeah. All right. So let's go on to number two. I think we've yeah. started covering it anyway because I think it's about chords, <laughs> right? Tell me about pop teaching hack number two. Yeah, so that's actually very closely related to what we already discussed right now. But I, I wrote down a chord, the magic of musical words. And yeah, actually, I just talked about that. That's just that's the way I approach these chords. I think of them as words that underpin multiple songs, whether in a very sophisticated pronunciation when we're arpeggiating all over the keyboard, so to speak, with maybe a lot of extension notes added, or in a super simple form with just the basic triad, actually the, the thing that we just talked about, you know, just playing those quarter beats with basic root position mm-hmm. triads. But I think that, and this is something that I like to call chunking, it's remembering a block of three notes at the same time, instead of having to learn all these single notes, of course, you have to know which single notes are in the chord. But once you have the grip, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I want to say it's its really what we just talked about. You know, it's so engaging for somebody to be able to play such a full and rich part already after a couple of lessons. Yes. But even if somebody already knows the notes and maybe you can play more difficult stuff when you take a step back and do this and just tell them that this is kind of a thing that belongs together again just like a word a c chord is a c e and a g however you decide on playing on playing them is uh, sort of the second step but if they can see that as a thing that belongs together, then they get a sort of an harmonic insight, and it's it's just all music is built this way, I've from got- you know Vivaldi to Bach to Beatles and Metallica and whatever. Absolutely, it's all it's all all chords. There is always a harmony. The only exception: atonal and serialism. I think that's about it. True. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, nobody wants to play that. Anyway, so. <laughs> well, I won't. I won't comment on that. But, no, uh, no, it's no. Certainly yeah, not the music I, that I choose yeah. to play. That's for sure. <laughs> of course, and I'm kidding as well. But I think maybe you know that's that's stepping outside of the ordinary path. Yeah. And if you want to, if you want to step outside, then that's fine. But just you know, stick to the basics first, yeah. maybe, and then you can extend further and further outside of the uh, regular path got a good story uh, in regard to what you were just saying with students who already know and can play music at a high level. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I took on a student two years ago, I think it was, and he yeah. uh, was a multi-instrumentalist and he'd got to a grade eight level on piano. Uh, so mm-hmm. high, high level, strong reader, classical, uh, amazing technique. Cool. And he actually came to me to learn about chords and composing he wanted to yeah. understand actually what he'd been playing. And during the course <laughs> yeah. of the year, and I only actually taught him for a year because it was at a school and he was moving on to other things, his eyes were just opened every lesson to all of this hidden knowledge of all this stuff. He was he was playing all of this music but yeah. had no idea, no idea how it was constructed and how easy it was in many ways for him to make up his own music. And uh, we had great fun. He he wrote some fantastic compositions and played a lot of music. And I think he enjoyed that and got more out of it than he did probably a lot of the eight years he studied or 10 or whatever it was mm-hmm. of just looking and learning to read and interpret music. So that's why I think these two things can go alongside with each other. I don't advocate either a whole chordal approach. I don't advocate a whole 
let's read music approach. I think it's all about balance and a mix. And I think the two work together amazingly well. Yeah. Yeah. Great story. And I, I totally feel you on that one. That's that's actually what I'm trying to put put forward as well here. Mm. More advanced players. You'll I've met so many classically trained musicians that are amazing at you know what you're saying uh, expression dynamics great feel technique out of this world but they didn't know what they were playing yeah That's you know right. and take away the music the, and say play something and, and exactly the, the, and they're lost and it's it's that's just a shame because if you add in this approach then just like you told the story that you just told it it all starts to make sense because as i already said earlier all music is built this way. You can ev- you can lead back everything uh, to the chords that underpin the tune that you're playing, whatever that might be. Yep, it's hundred yeah. percent. All right, let's go on to hack number three. Yeah, that was uh, building a musical vocabulary. Again, referring back to uh, I've already said way too much. I see now. <laughs> <laughs> The multifunctionality, well, that's that's what I've been talking about a little bit just earlier now. A chord can be used in many different ways. So as with building an actual vocabulary in a language, the more words you acquire, the more sentences you can play. So in this sense, the more chords you acquire, the more songs you can play. It's kind of just like that. And as probably we all know that chords uh, reoccur in many different songs. So I think when you uh, teach your students to play with chords and they build a vocabulary, then the uh, learning process gets gradually, gradually easier, faster. You know, it all starts making more and more sense because you see these things reoccur you know every Mm -hmm. new song that you teach actually or learn yeah so it's about Um, helping uh build on the foundation so let's say they start with you know the primary triads in the key of c and maybe an a mm -hmm. minor thrown in there they learn a Mm -hmm. few songs that use that and then it's like okay well let's try a different song oh this has got a uh a sus chord in it the suspension. So exactly. let's mm-hmm. add that to our vocabulary. Oh, this one's got a different root note. So it's a slash chord. So let's add that. So that's exactly. the kind of thing you're talking about here. It's, it's this yeah. uh, way that we can help students over time just yeah. add on, add a new word to their vocabulary that they can try. Exactly. Thanks for making that more practical than I was. Uh, <laughs> but that, that's exactly what I mean. Yeah, that yeah. would be getting more sophisticated, so to speak, because I was actually... I was actually one level behind. I thought we had C, G, A minor, and F, and maybe in the next song there was a B flat. You know, say we have a song in the key of F, so there is a new word, but you can still use that F as the root chord of the new song, and uh, maybe there is another C in there as being the five chord, something like that. You know, you start adding new chords, start adding more vocabulary, and then exactly as you said, there's maybe a, a sus chord, so you start adding some extensions, sus2, sus4, add a 6, add dominant 7, major 7 and all, and then you get to the more sophisticated words, chords, so to speak. And, and, I, and uh, I don't think yeah, any of this is is too hard for, for teachers who aren't familiar with chords to pick up. No. I think jazz can be... People can think what we're talking about when we start talking about seventh chords is all about jazz and how difficult jazz is and it's another whole language. And I would be mm. saying, no, no, no. It's it's actually just knowing some yeah, some simple added vocabulary around how no. to add a seventh to a chord. It, uh, that's not yeah. that's not too difficult. We're not talking about anything complex at all. And it's something that any teacher can teach because all of us have been playing chords all our life, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. so All we're saying is let's pass that vocabulary on to our students. Exactly. And if you've played any classical music, you've played sevens. Yes. No doubt about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's the classical solution, the dominant seven. So, yeah. And um, but also this this because the fourth hack, giving a quick peek over there, is about rhythm. Let's do you want to cover it? 
yeah, I want to cover it and because it, it actually closely relates to this vocabulary thing, because also in rhythm, this works the same. You know, it's also building vocabulary. If you can clap the quarter beats, the tempo of the song might change. The feel even might change. We have swing or non-swing and everything that's in between extreme kinds of swing and just straight music or straight uh, rhythms, sorry. But in the end, if you can distinguish your quarter beats and you can, let's say, just the these, these super simple pattern that we just talked about, playing the quarter beats with the right hand, then that's, that works on any song and every song has quarter beats. It's not, I'm not saying that all songs also accentuate these quarter beats, but that's, that will be the next step to add some more vocabulary to your rhythm vocabulary. So maybe let's say there are four quarter beats and you take away the third one, then you get a, a new pattern, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, that was that wasn't that was even adding a eighth beat before the next beat. Sorry for that, but <laughs> but but you get the drift, and that way by taking away or adding in the eighths and the sixteenth as well. So then I'm actually now getting to the fourth uh, hack, w- which was about rhythm, deconstructing the groove and adding the flow. This way you can deconstruct any type of rhythm and also with the single notes, it's, you know, all notes fall on a specific beat. If you don't have that beat that it falls upon, it becomes a totally different melody or a totally different rhythm rhythm part with the chords or whatever you're playing. So if we deconstruct that to quarters, eighths, sixteenths, and even maybe 30 30 seconds? Is that yeah. 30, 30 seconds? I don't know, 30 seconds, 32. yeah. 32s, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> we get what you mean. Um, then it's just a matter of which accents do you play and which do you leave open. And do you play them with the entire chord or do you play them with just a single note from that chord or maybe two notes played at the same time or whatever. So I think that's a really good way of getting a good feel of rhythm starting at the start just like with the basic triads for the the which notes are we going to play so the chords are the what what are we going to play a part and then the rhythm is how are we going to play the part basic quarters eighths and leaving them open and not you can get to the most crazy patterns that way and actually you can explain or clarify however you want to say that Mm. any piece of music just analyze it this way and and you can get as crazy as you want. All right, so let's just talk a little bit more about rhythm because the question yep. I get above all from teachers mm-hmm. who are mm-hmm. trying to teach pop music to their kids is what do I do with rhythm? Because we know that when you try and play what people sing, it tends to be quite difficult and particularly keeping yep. uh, a left hand rock steady while the right hand's doing all sorts of syncopated stuff. So uh, mm. I think this is where potentially our the way that I teach and you teach may diverge slightly because mm-hmm. I'm moving more and more towards discouraging students from trying to play what's sung and to mm-hmm. move them to singing it instead and accompanying themselves while they sing because purely the challenge of learning rhythm and playing rhythm they could do it with one hand and that's what i often mm-hmm. say when i'm when i'm um, presenting about pop music you know, get your student to learn the notes find, work out the notes and then just mm-hmm. play it because they'll be off to play it in time they've heard it so many times most kids can do that it, the mm-hmm. trouble comes when they try and then put a left hand with it doing something different i find so uh, that's one sure. one kind of take i've got and i'm interested in your views on that and the other one is if we do help them learn to play the rhythm as written, uh, sorry, that w- what is sung, what's yeah. what's your biggest biggest kind of tip or suggestion for that? How, how do you help other teachers with this challenge? Because I think it is one of the crucial hardest challenges of teaching pop. First, your 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 first point. Uh, I'm totally with you there. I actually disencourage people to play sung melodies or melodies that are originally sung, but I think my motivation behind that might be a little bit different from yours. But in my opinion, you know, those melodies are written to be sung. And it might be a little bit strange to say that this, but 
pop melodies aren't all that interesting to play. You know, they're oftentimes they're they're just two, three, four, maybe five different notes. And then, as you mentioned, it's the rhythm that makes them engaging and difficult to play, maybe. So I, I, I just always encourage people to try and listen to the different instrumental parts that are going on. Maybe there is a funky bass synthesizer doing crazy stuff. Well, you can play that with your left hand while you're playing a piano part or uh, whatever synthesizer uh, part with your right hand. As we just discussed, there are so many things that you can do with these chords. You can, uh, you know, make crazy runs up and down the keyboard while still just playing a C chord or any type of chord for that matter. So I think it's way more interesting to look at creating an engaging accompaniment part because let's let's be honest, when Paul McCartney, for instance, would accompany himself on the piano, he, he also doesn't play his melody. He sings that, right? Mm, yep. So if, if this is the style that you want to play, then playing melodies is not the thing that you want to do, actually, unless it's maybe some kind of funky synthesizer hook or whatever. I don't, I don't know if you know... Uh, Avicii songs, or you know, oh, yeah, yeah, these, yeah. These, yeah, these, these are built on melodic hooks. Well, okay, most of the time these can be pretty cool to play. Then it, th that's that's my approach as well. I actually almost never teach them to play an actual uh, singing melody, but let's say if you want to do that, because that was the second half of your question, I think. Mm, yeah, the challenge. My approach is and would be and is the quarter beats with the left hand just either play the root note of the first chord or the root notes of the entire chord progression if possible and with the right hand just play eighths first of all and not play them but uh, clap them on your thigh because right. this is doing something different with your left hand and your right hand already but you don't have to think that much about your right hand it's just clapping but you get the rhythmic feel after you've done the eighths, quite good possibility that you've already hit all the accents that are a melody accent, so to speak. So the next step would be to maybe take it down one notch. First, just the right hand, clap on your thigh, the actual melody. So no notes, just clap them on your thigh so that you get a good feel of where the melody falls without having to focus on the notes yet. Mm. Then do the same thing. Uh, left hand the quarter beats, right hand clap that melody on your thigh, or maybe that was the step that you already were. And then the next step will be just to go for it, I guess. Maybe you can, if if it's still difficult, and it might be because, you know, it's in the end it's also a matter of just practicing, you could not make them play the uh, quarter notes with the left hand, although I do encourage this because you're actually doing something, you know, with an actual rhythm in the left hand. Yeah, you're keeping but the just, beat. But you could take yeah. that away, couldn't you, and just you, hold, you could, hold yeah. the chord or something. Exactly, exactly that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and then it depends on the level of your student, obviously. Uh, how difficult do you want to get with the left hand? You could add a maybe alternating bass octaves or maybe stride piano even or, you know, play a 1-5-1. One, one. So... That's a low octave, a fifth of the chord, and then an octave above. Or maybe a Debussy-style walk over a nine chord. So uh, do you follow still? Yes. Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you that's... Know. That kind of Yes, sounds. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but that that depends on the level of your student, and uh, I'd say just take it from there. As uh, as I was advocating from the very start, take it from a very basic level, and I think the basic level of the rhythm is the quarters. So, if they can keep a steady rhythm with the left hand on the quarters, if it's too difficult to change the chord, just first stick on the first chord. Just just let them play the root note of the first chord or the entire chord, but just in a steady quarter beat, and then eighths tapping and afterwards tapping the actual melodic rhythm 
which, as you already mentioned, they have in their head because they can sing it as well, right? Yeah, exactly right. And I think just mm. to come back to the start when you were talking about hack number four, which was about rhythm, and to relate that to the previous ones, we were talking about vocabulary and building vocabulary. Just as mm -hmm. you you don't start with the most complex chords, or well, you try not to, no. you, you start with simple mm -hmm. ones. I think the approach could be if uh, teachers are serious about helping their students be able to do this kind of thing is to build a vocabulary of rhythms and patterns and grooves from the start, exactly. but starting with yeah. here's a quarter note beat and being able to yes, ex uh, you exactly. know, tap a beat and keep a pulse. And I, I like doing yeah. this. Uh, I just this week released my what I call my notebook beginners framework, which is what I do with beginners before they start anything to do with uh, method books and reading. And one of those things that they do in their first two or three lessons is learn to tap a rhythm while keeping a beat in the you know, yeah, in awesome. either hand or with their foot or whatever it is. And I think that kind of stuff, that's what we should be building up, build those skills so that when they come to starting to want to learn a pop song, uh, mm -hmm. they've got some something to, to, to work from, some background to work from. Exactly. And this also is, I think it's very valuable if they even want to, um, how do you say, evolve, I want to say evolve actually to classical music later on. Mm. Because let's be honest here, pop music is just a very good place to start because it's not all that difficult to play. Exactly. Yeah. At Le least leaving you, aside you can, the rhythm stuff we've been talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And you can make it as crazy as you want because I don't know if you've ever heard of neo soul music or something that's that that's pop music as well, but it's super difficult, jazzy stuff. So yeah. it can get difficult, but you can strip it down to a very, very simple form. And and that's why it's valuable. Yeah. No, that's great. Well, look, let's move on to your last hack, number five. Yeah. So number five was the chords and patterns approach, uh, sort of the two foundational building blocks of my approach. Chords on the one hand and the patterns patterns on the other hand, where the chords are, as I think I already mentioned before, what notes are we using? And the patterns is actually the rhythm stuff deconstructed. So as I was saying before, a pattern is basically just created from playing specific accents and leaving specific accents open. And... First step, as mentioned, the quarter beats, eighth beats, sixteenth beats, triplets uh, can be added, and then we have different. Can't figure out the words for you know six to eight measure different kinds of measures. Uh, time signatures, obviously. you mean? Time signatures. Sorry yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah, it's the the Dutch in my. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. So getting a really good grasp of all those different things that are in there, and then just messing around with them you know and then the patterns they arise from playing specific accents you know first with the with a whole chord and maybe with some inversions you could add extensions and then with just this one pattern for example the very first basic one that i was just talking about the quarter beats with the right hand you can already play dozens of different things if you switch up the chords but on the other hand with the same chord, adding different patterns, maybe you know you have a pattern where you play the first eighth, uh, the first eighth beat, the third eighth beat, the seventh eighth beat. Then, then it already gets kind of funky, mm, you know. Yes. And then, if the first was a full chord, the second was just the top note of your voicing that you had on that beat, and then the middle note of your voicing, for instance. That this way, you know, these these piano parts arise, and that's that's the way I think of uh, music actually in general, because this is creating parts, but you can also analyze parts that already exist in this way, and you know, t t sort of tackle it from the other way around. Mm. So, you, yeah, sorry. You, you teach rhythm in grid format, don't you? Would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just absolutely. give us a really quick overview of that because I know that there will be teachers who haven't come across this way of teaching before and this building of – this is mainly a way of building pattern recognition and knowledge, right? Yeah, which which as mentioned, I think it, it evolves uh, or gets bigger. Sorry, the grows, Dutch again in my yeah. head. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, grows, it, it can be translated to all types of music. Everything can be led back to this, but 
what what I tried to do or what I did actually in my method was just draw a block that is divided up into four equal parts. Then we have one measure made visual uh, with four quarter beads. And then I make one quarter bead red, or actually if we, if we say the pattern that I was just referring to, the basic pattern, we make all those blocks red. And then that that's the way that I made this uh, pattern stuff visual. So when a block is red, you play it. This this was what you were talking about, right? Yeah, or yeah, am I yeah. uh, no, 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 that's right. That's question. right. Okay, yeah. But because so, you know, we, and, I, and I think I like this idea because there are certain patterns that come up all the time uh, mm-hmm. in pop music. For example, the Coldplay da da do da 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 one two three one two three one two one two three, and yep. for students to be able to visualize that in a grid format can can really help. I think that's why I liked I liked finding out that you did that. Yeah. And it's actually, so the, the pattern is engaging, but it's actually kind of simple because you would have ta 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 So we have the ta 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 then we have one open. So I have three red blocks, one white block, or not filled with color, whatever you want to use, and then three again, right? If you imagine it like this, or even if you see it on screen or an iPad or print it out, then it's actually not that difficult to play that rhythm, right? Yeah, that's it. And uh, there's uh, yeah. an, an app I like that does this. It's called, I think it's called, is it My Rhythm? Uh, cool. On on iPad, we'll uh, we'll pop a link in the show notes anyway. And it's it's got a grid cool. format and a couple of drums on the side that you tap and you try and keep beat with these dots moving across the grid. It's a pretty cool cool little app anyway. Nice. Um, I like nice. to explore. But look, yeah, uh, we're running close to uh, to running out of time, so. Um, <laughs> I'm just blabbering and jibber jabbering. Not Sorry at all. No, that. it's been really, 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 really useful. I did want to ask you just yeah. a couple of quick final questions. One was the idea of teaching kids a pop song or something to do with a pop song by rote. So by yeah. that I mean just showing, just demonstrating and getting them to copy you. Uh, do you ever use that? Do you think that's a good idea? Obviously, it wouldn't be the only way we teach, but uh, to throw that in a lesson every now and then. I think it's great. Actually, I do it a lot myself because um, I'm being very active on YouTube, where this is actually the whole approach, of course. Yeah, you're the so, you're the reason that so many piano teachers get upset because their uh, their students go and look at your videos and come in and can play something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but you're, it, that, you're that proves, what's wrong with piano teaching, Coon. <laughs> th- this proves the efficiency of. Just no, but okay, without, I, I, I really think this is a great way of teaching because it hooks back into the engagement, the engaging uh, part, if you know what I'm saying. Mm. And in all honesty, if I think about purely tr- classical training, then it, it, it would be kind of impossible for something to just explain what's on a sheet, how these notes work. So he say, says, okay, this is a C, this is a G, this is again, and explains the whole concept behind sheet music and then says, so go for it. You know, there's always this exemplification where somebody plays what's actually meant to be played, so to speak. So in that sense, I think with this pop music, it works even better. And I think when you think about that, somebody is probably pretty easy to uh, regurgitate something from their musical mind being a melody or whatever from a pop song or that that's actually kind of the same thing right only you don't see it but you hear it uh, so I, I, music in the end is just a way of communication and if you can exemplify by doing then the student can see how how it has to be done proper technique uh, where the fingers have to be placed i think it's it's not only a good idea i think you'd be a fool to not do this at least what you say combine it with the explaining the theory behind it and all that yeah i think that's a good way to kind of summarize what i what my approach is which is we should be doing a bit of everything we should be teaching yeah. a little bit help students learn by ear we should be yeah. 
showing them stuff every now and then if they need a little yeah. uh, pick up how to play the Simpsons tune or the Coldplay intro. Just just show mm-hmm. them and they've got a really quick win in a lesson and a hook back to to do some more practice. Let's show them some yeah. patterns. Let's show them some chord progressions. Let's also teach them how to read. Let's make sure they have a good technique. Uh, I mean, yeah. it, it sounds like a lot, but if we interrelate it all, that's mm-hmm. the way that we can actually uh, cover all this stuff in in a period of time with students without feeling like we're just going crazy trying to do too much, I think. Yeah, I think you're totally right. All right. So you're, you've got lots of resources online. Uh, so your website is Piano Couture. So that's piano dash c o u t u r e dot mm-hmm. com. Uh, exactly. So that's tell just really quick overview. What kind of things would teachers find there that they might find useful? I think um, it, it, when I first started it, I it was purely to teach people how to play piano. So it was purely uh, student focused, so to speak. How can I play this song? And I just exemplified it and explained a bit chord theory behind it. But I'm moving more and more towards what's you know all these correlation type things that we we've been talking about what's the underlying value of these chords how can i use them to uh, get a better insight into music rhythm stuff as well and also how do i practice efficiently and um basically just the value of chords the value of harmonies the value of maybe pop music and it's uh how do i say this how it how it relates to other types of music okay well. yeah it's play i was gonna yeah. say it's place in the whole genre of music and experience that we're giving our students exactly so what would a uh, teacher find maybe material to use in their lessons or a mindset for practicing that type of stuff and mm. if they if they want to teach a student a song or if a student wants to learn a song i have i have dozens of them i think i have over 160 now so there there's a kind of big large resource for playing songs as well that's Licks, great techniques oh, I, I have all that, that and, stuff and on that's there, on so. youtube as well uh yeah most yep. of my videos i post on youtube but i also i'm i'm blogging more uh, consistently now so i also try to give some more insight into my mind what <laughs> the concept behind that lesson actually was that's great yeah, so, yeah that's great yeah. and i think you uh, had did you have uh, something that you were going to give away as well to teachers today absolutely yeah well uh, cuz you've got an ebook i know which is crazy comprehensive right <laughs> um that, and, that was the idea yeah yeah, yeah. and so and, and, and which it is and so I, I thought um i was thinking that uh it would be awesome to share a chapter or so from that book perhaps on uh maybe on the, on the rhythm or something like that perhaps but uh we'll pop, I, pop a link to that in the show notes what were you thinking on that cool yeah absolutely i think uh well to k- wrap it up back to the very start the thing that we already discussed I saw this guitarist play a couple of chords, strum a couple of chords, everybody singing along, and we had a great party. I figured this must be possible on the piano as well, and that's the main motivation for starting to write my own method after I finished conservatory. To just simplify the learning process and approach this like a guitarist would approach it from a chordal angle so to speak so Mm. i try to keep it as simple as possible and it's all built on this chords the harmony what notes are we going to play patterns the rhythm on the other hand how are we going to play those notes and the uh, ebook sample that i is is just a selection of chapters from my whole ebook called hack the piano and uh, this is just a couple of chapters. I think there is an introduction to the rhythm part as well in there. So Fantastic. Oh, I really appreciate oh. that. Thank you oh. so much for your time today, uh, Kuhn. It's been great hanging out with you. And I look forward to maybe doing some more stuff with you down the track. I think we've got yeah. very similar f- theories and approaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's lots of synergies between what we're doing. If you want to find out more awesome. about uh, Kuhn and his work, piano-couture.com is where to go. We'll have full links to download uh, his ebook chapters and also to any of the things that we've talked about in today's 
podcast on the show notes page. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I really hope you got a lot out of it and have enjoyed our conversation. As a reminder, full show notes, transcript, and that copy of Kuhn's ebook is available at timtopham.com slash episode 86. So make sure you head there to grab some of the links and the information from today's episode. And if you're enjoying these podcasts, it would be fantastic to leave a review on my Facebook page if you get a chance. My Facebook page is Tim Topham Creative Piano Teaching. You can search for it from anywhere in Facebook. And if you go on the right-hand side, you'll see a spot where you can leave a review. Uh, It's always fantastic to read these. I really do appreciate them. And it does help me be able to spread the word to piano teachers around the world about these podcasts and some of the training that I've got. Until next episode, I'll see you soon. We'll conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.